Good morning, everyone. I think we can all agree that the Indian Ocean has become a key maritime focus for the 21st century. And this is due to a number of factors. First and foremost is economic. The Indian Ocean region is rich in energy resources, minerals, and commodities. Importantly, international activity depends on the free and uninterrupted flow of commerce across the oceans. The Indian Ocean is particularly notable given the tremendous volume of oil, bulk cargo, and container shipment that pass through the region every day. And these shipments are crucial to keep powering the world's economies. This in turn has brought more and more states to focus on the safety and security of the region's slocks. The vast area of the Indian Ocean, its difficult po uh, coastlines to penetrate, crowded sea lanes, and failed states on their own create the perfect set of variables for piracy to flourish. But when coupled with the existence of three significant choke points in the Straits of Hormuz, Bab el Mandeb, and Malacca, they carry the potential to threaten global economies, making the Indian Ocean slock security a second key focus for states throughout the world. And because of the vast amount of economic activity that's so vital to nations' economies, and the threat to that economic activity by both state and non-state actors, there is a third strategic reason why the Indian Ocean is becoming a key maritime focus in the 21st century. Today, not only do you continue to have the involvement of extra-regional powers, but we are witnessing the rise of new regional powers that are increasingly growing in their ability to project power. All these countries have a common interest in keeping global trade in goods and energy freely flowing, but arguably they come with different national interests, different commitment to uh, global norms, and varying measurements of power, leading to a situation where the Indian Ocean is increasingly becoming a hub of political, strategic, and economic activities by resident powers and non-resident powers alike. And finally, while these issues of economic, slock security, and strategic importance remain a familiar problem set for policymakers. There is arguably a much harder problem set to conceptualize, and that is non-traditional security issues. Be it the degradation of the environment, climate change that is threatening to submerge regional coastlines, or the over-exploitation of ocean resources, particularly illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, all of these threaten the interests and futures of the region's countries and peoples. What all this points to is the fact that the Indian Ocean is home to continually evolving challenges. As such, we have to ask ourselves, how are states responding, both big and small, resident and non-resident alike? What are the primary interests of key states, and how are they pursuing those interests? And given the crowded space that the Indian Ocean is increasingly becoming, what does the future hold for intra- and cross-regional relations? Because the region's challenges require multi-state responses, we also have to consider what the status of regionalism is like in the Indian Ocean, and whether we can call it a coherent area where all the powers of all sizes can interact uh, effectively. Now, to help us understand develop developments in the Indian Ocean region and answer some of these questions, we are very fortunate today to have three prominent naval men. Admiral Nirmal Verma, Commodore Lee Cordner, and Commodore Mohammed Rashid Ali. We will begin by hearing from Admiral Verma, who having served more than four decades in the Indian Navy, holding a number of very distinguished posts, including Chief of Naval Staff, is currently the High Commissioner of India to Canada. He will be followed by Commodore Cordner, who is both a maritime scholar as well as strategic analyst and policy advisor, having enjoyed more than three decades of full-time service with the Royal Australian Navy. And rounding out our panel will be Commodore Ali of the Bangladesh Navy, who enjoys three decades of service and currently serves as the Navy's Director of Naval Intelligence. And like the previous panel, I would guide you to the, to the conference booklet for more detailed biographies. With that, I will turn it over to Admiral Verma. Admiral Ron Buck, Henri Chair, MSC 2014, General Dan Leaf, Director, APCSS, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to exchange my views on the subject of Indian Ocean. 
I must also add that the views are my own and may not necessarily reflect that of my government. It is also a fortuitous coincidence that my co-panelists are old friends. I met Commodore Rashid Ali during my visit to Bangladesh, and Lee Kortner is my classmate from the Naval War College class of 1993. Oh, we take some time. Okay. As we look at the developments in the Indian Ocean, it would be in order to examine its contours in the first place. The Indian Ocean region, or IOR, contains a third of the world's population, 20 to 30 percent of its total mass, and 40 percent of the oil and gas resources of the world. Its waters host vital sea lanes of communication that are critical to some of Asia's largest economies. With global energy needs expected to rise by 45% by 2030, the trade in energy slots in the Indian Ocean will acquire new salience. In terms of access into the Indian Ocean, access is possible through seven critical choke points. The Cape of Good Hope of South Africa, the Suez Canal in Egypt, Babel Mandib of Djibouti, Yemen, Strait of Hormuz between Iran and Oman, Strait of Malacca of Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, the Sunda Strait between Java and Sumatra, and the Lombok Strait of the Indonesian islands of Bali and Lombok. The 23,000 ships that move US $7 trillion worth of international trade each year in the slots in the Indian Ocean are most vulnerable at these choke points. The IOR comprises of 33 nations with two extra regional states maintaining territory within the region, these being France in the overseas region of Réunion and the UK in the British Indian Ocean Territory, consisting of the atolls of the Chagos Archipelago, including Diego Garcia, currently under lease to the United States. This is also a region of immense economic disparity. At one end, countries like India and the ASEAN states are politically stable and economies that are doing well and are on a trajectory of increased growth. At the same time, there are a number of states that could fail politically and economically. Some of the most enduring rivalries between countries are the result of arbitrarily drawn boundaries by the former colonial powers when the former gained independence. I am required to cover these three questions during the course of my presentation. Raja Menon, a maritime security commentator from India, suggests the players in the Indian Ocean region could be categorized into three categories, big, regional, and passive. The big players include countries that justify stake in the entire Indian Ocean and can bring to bear adequate capability in the area. A close look would show that only three countries really fall into this category, the US, China, and India. Further, the interplay between these three powers would have a major influence on developments in the Indian Ocean. The regional players are the nations that seek to influence a part of the ocean that is relevant to their strategic interests. These include France, Australia, Japan, UK, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, Iran, Israel, Malaysia, Russia, South Africa, Korea, Singapore, and Pakistan. The last category of countries are the passive actors who find themselves in a difficult position to exert any influence. Djibouti, Madagascar, Maldives, Mauritius, Somalia, Sri Lanka, Kenya, Myanmar, Oman, Seychelles, and Yemen, etc., could be considered as examples of this category. 
It is possible some in the audience would have a different view on this categorization. At this point, let us see the maritime capability that these players bring into the IOR. France rejects the notion that it is an extra-regional power in the Indian Ocean. Its navy is forward deployed at Mayotte, La Reunion, Djibouti, and Abu Dhabi, while Djibouti being a major logistics base for French naval forces deployed from the Atlantic and Mediterranean commands. France also maintains a sizable force in the IOR. France's deep involvement in the Indian Ocean is also evident from its defense agreements with Djibouti, Comoros, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Madagascar, and Mauritius. In view of its island territories, French EZ in the Indian Ocean amounts to more than a quarter of the total French EEZ. It is understood that French naval activity in the waters of Indian Ocean represents about 30% of the total French maritime activity. France's Indian Ocean territories are of strategic significance as they are on the crossroads of major commercial maritime traffic. Pakistan has a capable Navy with good surface and air capability and impressive subsurface capability. Iran is an acknowledged regional military power in the Arabian Gulf and has also undertaken periodic deployments beyond it to signal its potential of out-of-area capability. Among the regional players, Australia is an important power and is building its combat capabilities to include new submarines, air defense destroyers, amphibious assets, fighter jets, long-range maritime patrol aircraft. I expect Lee Cordner will delve in this in more detail. Japan intrinsic intrinsically has interest in the IOR for economic reasons, particularly since its energy lifeline transits through the region. Any active deployment of its forces is circumscribed by Article 9 of its constitution. Though Japan has forward deployed its maritime and air forces out of its military facilities in Djibouti at a point of time in the past. Japan's commitment in larger measure to Southeast Asia is limited to financial and technological assistance as it places importance on cooperative mechanisms for safe transit of its trade in the IOR. From the days of the Cold War, when the former Soviet Union invested heavily in the IOR, including access to bases, the current scene is a far cry. Greater reliance is placed on maintaining good diplomatic relations with the littorals with periodic deployment of Russian naval ships. When the Royal Navy withdrew east of Suez, it leased Diego Garcia to the US in 1996. However, it maintains a limited presence in the Persian Gulf as part of its multinational forces. The military expenditure among IOR states averages 2 to 3% of the GDP. With the exception of a few countries in West Asia, like Saudi Arabia, which spends close to 9%, and Oman, which spends 4 to 5%. Further, the Navy often remains a stepchild in suballocation of the defense budget in many of the IOR countries, where the Army plays a major role. Consequently, very few local navies have the funds to create a strong maritime presence. Coming to the bigger players, US has a very substantial naval presence in the region on a sustained basis that includes participation in task forces 150, 151, and 152 following the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Besides, the US Fifth Fleet headquartered in Bahrain can be further augmented by forces from the other fleets when required. Maritime security operations appear to emerge as a principal US mission post 9-11 and op Operation Iraqi Freedom. Diego Garcia remains its major logistics hub, 
Besides, the U.S. Navy enjoys access to several ports in the IOR. It also has basing agreements with a number of countries in the IOR. Its presence is by and large seen as a security provider by most countries and coercive by the odd one. China is another major player that has regular deployments in the IOR. One operation that has stood out is a sustained deployment of a task force for anti-piracy operations that was covered in detail by Professor Wang. Concurrently, China has adopted soft power diplomacy most aggressively that would certainly aid it in shaping the strategic environment in the IOR in the long run. China has made heavy investments in creating infrastructure, particularly maritime infrastructure, in a number of countries in the IOR through large loans on easy repayment terms. It has also made substantial investments in the resources sector in Africa and continues to do so. And then finally, coming to India. Among the bigger players, India is the only resident power, and I emphasize the word resident. The Navy was for many decades a poor cousin in the fund allocation of the defense budget, largely driven due to the four wars fought by India between 1948 and 71 on the issue of contested land borders, in which the land forces played the predominant role. This has changed over the last decade, and the Navy is currently developing a modest three-dimensional capability. Its dependence on using the sea for trade has increased substantially following the economic reforms in 1990s and the increasing requirement to import energy. Having had an overview of the powers operating in the region, let us take a look at the nature of threats and challenges faced by littorals in the IOR. There would be competing strategic interests of major powers in IOR. However, traditional threats would largely revolve on issues of maritime sovereignty. For example, there are certain islands under French control and claimed by Madagascar, or the dispute between Iran and UAE over certain islands in the Persian Gulf. Delineation of maritime boundaries is another area for possible disputes, like the one between India and Pakistan. The saving grace is that such maritime disputes have not led to any hostilities yet. Here I would like to mention the case on the resolving of the maritime boundary between Bangladesh and India. The services of the International Tribunal on Laws of the Seas were taken. The award announced recently goes largely in favor of Bangladesh, opening the way to a huge easy and exploitation of the undersea resources. The same has been readily accepted by India. Hopefully it encourages other countries to follow this option in cases of disputed maritime boundaries. There is also the possibility that a conflict over land borders spills over into the maritime domain. However, more worrisome are the non-traditional threats to maritime security. The more prominent being, firstly, the vulnerability of slocks, which Jeffrey also talked about. Any disruption to the free flow of trade, even temporarily, would drive up energy costs. This was seen when Iran threatened to close the Straits of Hormuz. Secondly, we have seen the impact of piracy of Somalia that cost the global shipping industry billions of dollars in ransoms and damages. It is only due to the concerted efforts by navies of the world coming together, despite otherwise competing interests, that this specter was brought under control. Third is the issue of maritime terrorism. Be it Al-Shabaab in East Africa, Al-Qaeda in the Middle East, or now the IS, Jamia Ismailia in Southeast Asia, violent extremist organizations pose a direct threat to nations throughout IOR and beyond. 
In 2008, Mumbai and India was the target of an attack by lashkar e taiba operating out of Pakistan. Fourthly are natural disasters that seem to increase in their intensity year after year. The Asia-Pacific is the locus of natural disasters with IOR alone accounting for 70% of them. Of the 16 countries under the extreme risk category, nine are from IOR. Fifthly is unmitigated exploitation of marine resources like fish that results in significant economic and social losses. And finally, there is a concern of illegal migration, which includes both migrant smuggling and people trafficking, as also smuggling of arms. The nature of maritime security challenges in the IOR is such that no single nation can tackle them alone. Regional cohesion and cooperation is the best approach to confront these challenges. Each state, therefore, has an obligation to contribute to maritime security. The Indian Ocean Rim countries have established a number of multilateral organizations to address the issues of economic cooperation as well as maritime security. Firstly, coming to IORA, which is the Indian Ocean Rim Association, is in effect the largest Indian Ocean economic grouping that brings together countries straddling the three continents of Africa, Asia, and Australia. For the first time, it has addressed maritime security issues in its deliberations. However, this initiative is yet to achieve the desired traction. Yet another multilateral grouping is the Beamstick, Bay of Bengal Initiative of Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, quite a tongue twister. But here again, this grouping has not really progressed because of the emphasis given to the South Asian Association for Additional Cooperation. The Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, or IONS, is a 35-member Indian Ocean Security Forum that facilitates exchange of views on maritime security issues impacting on the Indian Ocean. The chairmanship rotates around the four regions here and is currently held by Australia. With the passage of time, it is expected to further consolidate its activities. However, for it to be truly successful, it must be anchored to a higher political structure in the IOR. Another mini forum, so to say, is Milan that meets Confluence. Uh, this exercise is steered by India on its eastern seaboard, and it is something which started off with very minimal representation, but it has grown with time. The 2014 Milan at Port Blair was significant from the perspective that 17 navies participated, including two from Africa, three IOR nation states, Mauritius, Maldives, Seychelles, and the navies of Philippines and Cambodia made their debut. How effective have these fora been in tackling maritime security issues and building a cohesive pan-IOR security structure? I'm afraid we have not done as well as one would have liked to do and this is because, the, because of the sensitivities on sovereignty and maritime jurisdiction, as also the capacities of its members. Different perceptions on the role of external powers is another factor. That is not to conclude that these fora are re redundant. They're definitely required for facilitating confidence building. Now, what is India's perspective? As a maritime force, the Indian Navy must secure a maritime environment for free While the Indian Navy is fully geared to tackle traditional military threats to national security, the non-traditional threats require a collective effort. As seen, the existing multilateral fora falls short in fully addressing these concerns in a cohesive way. At the same time, the first responders would have to be the regional powers. It is this role that India tries to discharge as best as possible. To begin with, it is not that India has given up on multilateral fora. Every effort is being made to ensure that these fora can be made cohesive and responsive. 
As our Prime Minister said recently, India has unwavering belief in multilateralism. Meanwhile, India's efforts are directed towards filling in the gaps unilaterally, bilaterally, and in sub-regional groupings. One advantage that India enjoys in its relations with virtually all nations in IOR is that, quote, India threatens no one and is a friend to many, unquote. These words have not emanated from an Indian. I have quoted the Prime Minister of Australia, Honorable Tony Abbott, during his recent visit to India. As far as unilateral response is concerned, it works for HADR very effectively. And this was seen in India's help extended during the 2004 tsunami. At the bilateral level, we have extensive relations with the maritime neighbors, particularly the smaller island nations of IOR. Many are also beneficiaries or defense lines of credit extended by India. We have also concluded defense MOUs with a number of countries. We have worked closely with Sri Lanka and uh, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Thailand, and Myanmar, these three countries. With them, we conduct coordinated patrols. And of course, we exercise with navies across the IOR. India has helped in capacity building of our smaller maritime neighbors in a modest way. In the case of island nation states with whom we have an enduring and growing partnership. Our cooperation with Mauritius dates back many decades. We helped them to set up a, a coast guard and also helped in manning the assets till they could acquire the necessary expertise. This pattern has been followed in Maldives and Seychelles as well. We also conduct hydrographic service training and we have set up surveillance networks for them. On the sub-regional approach, India has taken a step of, since we have not got into the multilateral uh, structure as we, we would have liked, and the first of these started with a, a meeting of the national security advisors of Sri Lanka, Maldives, and India in October 2011. The second meeting was in 2013, where the three countries agreed on a wide range of issues for enhancing cooperation that included maritime domain awareness and SAR, and joint exercises among others. It was also decided to encourage some other countries to join this fora, and we are happy to note that the third NSA meeting, which took place in, in March this year, had uh, the presence of Mauritius and Seychelles as well. In conclusion, I would like to say, with the center of economic development in the IOR moving eastwards, there can be no two views on the importance of the Indian Ocean. The traditional and non-traditional maritime threats call for establishing a cooperative and collaborative security structure. There are a number of multilateral fora with a mix of economic and security agenda, as also varying membership of IOR countries. The diversity of political systems and maritime capability, as also the issues of sovereignty among some nations, currently come in the way of a cohesive pan-Indian ocean maritime structure. It is yet work in progress. India as the major resident power in the Indian Ocean has been putting in substantial effort to fill in the gaps through bilateral and some regional initiatives with the aim of eventually having a truly pan-Indian Ocean maritime security architecture. Thank you.